you everybody for being here. This is super exciting. Uh, Blue Hat Israel is awesome. I'm glad that you all made the time to come out and uh, see some really amazing presentations that we've had from everybody so far. So, so thank you. So uh, as the intro said, my name is Matt Miller. I've had the pleasure of getting to be kind of on the front lines of how we think about responding to vulnerabilities, uh, particularly as they have to do with uh, Microsoft and our products. Uh, the team that I work on in the Microsoft Security Response Center, we get to see all the vulnerabilities that come in through our front door, and we get to think about smart ways to try to actually, uh, rather than just fixing one bug at a time, try to find ways to really change the landscape, change the game, make things better for, for our customers and everybody out there that's are using our products and services. So uh, I've been at Microsoft for about 10 years now, and I've been kind of in this role of trying to think about how do we change this landscape. And so this talk is really an opportunity to take you all on a sort of journey through what are we seeing today? What, how has the landscape evolved? What type of trends are we actually seeing going from the era of trivial to exploit stack-based buffer overruns to really complicated multi-chain exploits that are now the norm and what we see in the ecosystem? So we'll kind of talk about some of those trends. We'll go then from there to shift about, well, what are some of the challenges that we're actually facing today and how we think about approaching the problem space of vulnerability mitigation? And from there, we'll shift gears and talk about how those challenges are shaping our thinking for what do we want to shift and focus more on in the future to try to tackle this problem space. So let's go. So for those of you who may not be deep into the vulnerability mitigation space, I think it's probably helpful to frame a little bit of how we think about this problem space. And when you think about a vulnerability, uh, ultimately what an attacker is trying to do is they're trying to take a vulnerability in some software component and use that as a vector for delivering some type of payload to the target device. They want to run some code, they want to do something using this vulnerability. And so you want to go from A to B. And so how does this actually work in practice? Well, first of all, there's lots of different types of software vulnerabilities, stack buffer overruns, heap buffer overruns, so on and so forth. And what attackers have done over time is they've really studied those classes of vulnerabilities, and they've come up with techniques to take those vulnerabilities and pivot them into other types of primitives. Uh, eventually, as Bruno talked about in the talk previously, they get to this point where they get an arbitrary read-write, and this is kind of the Swiss army knife of the exploit. Uh, and from there, they go on to their generic exploitation primitives to be able to run arbitrary code, uh, data-only corruption, things like that. And this is kind of the final stage that ultimately enables them to deliver their payload. So when you think about trying to mitigate this space, there's sort of a few phases you can think about it. One, you can try to think about eliminating vulnerabilities uh, just kind of at the root cause. Two, you can think about trying to break those techniques, those primitives that attackers use to actually try to go from A to B from that vulnerability. And three, there's containment. So actually limit what the payload can do when it's running on the target device. So these are kind of how you can think about this. Now it turns out today, one vulnerability typically isn't enough. And that's because we've entered this era where we have sandboxing. And so what this means is that an attacker is going to need to have another vulnerability to actually elevate privileges on the device. And this means that when we think from a defense perspective, we've got to apply those same defenses to that privileged attack surface. And this kind of continues. You might have multiple layers of containment. But at the end of the day, you eventually reach a point where you lose containment. And this really means, from a defense perspective, you either got to kill the bugs or you got to break the techniques. Uh, so this is just a, at a very high level how you can think about this problem space. Now, Microsoft's been at this for a while. We've been thinking about how can we go about mitigating vulnerabilities. And we've been pursuing a, a, a common strategy in this space for over 10 years now. And really, the strategy boils down to how are we going to make it as difficult and costly to find, exploit, and leverage a vulnerability? And uh, the tactics that we think about here go back to what I just talked about on the previous slide. Well, on the one hand, we can look for ways to eliminate vulnerabilities as much as possible. But you know, we know there are going to be vulnerabilities. So how are we going to break those exploitation techniques that attackers can rely on? And we know we probably aren't going to be able to break all of the exploitation techniques. So how can we contain damage, limit persistence, uh, prevent persistence, and so on? And finally, if all else fails, how are we going to limit the window of opportunity for an attacker to actually leverage uh, a vulnerability uh, in an exploit? And there are a bunch of different things that we've pursued to date uh, in these kind of different tactics. So as I mentioned on in the introduction, you know, we've been at this for a while. How has the landscape evolved uh, in response to these things? So let's start talking about trends. Uh, so I am going to throw a lot of data, uh, and I'm going to try to explain it as we go through. Uh, but this will give you a flavor of how you know, we look at the landscape and how we actually try to measure how the landscape is changing to inform our thinking of how we approach uh, vulnerability mitigation and defense. So first, it's important to define our scope. What are we going to be looking at in terms of trends? Uh, and when you think about 
how Microsoft deals with response to vulnerabilities, we typically address vulnerabilities in one of two ways. So as a researcher, uh, thank you for all the researchers who have reported vulnerabilities to us through our bounty programs. You send a vulnerability report over to secure at Microsoft.com. We say, OK, yep, interesting. We're going to open an MSRC case for that. Lots and lots of magic happens behind the scenes. And either we ship a fix uh, through an online service update, or we ship a fix through a software update, typically on Update Tuesday of every month, uh, to the endpoint device. Now, when you look at a very macro level, in 2018, about 54% of the reported vulnerabilities that we addressed were addressed through a security update that we shipped to an endpoint. And about 85% of those were classified in terms of severity and uh, an impact of what we call remote code execution, elevation of privilege, and information disclosure. This is kind of the security impact of those issues. So for our talk today, we're going to focus on those remote code execution, elevation of privilege, and information disclosure issues that actually were addressed through a fix that we shipped to an endpoint uh, through a product. Now, with that kind of set, setting our scope, now let's start to dive into some of the data. So at a very, very macro level, what we're seeing today is that more vulnerabilities are being fixed, but fewer vulnerabilities are being exploited. And so if you look at the chart right here, what this is showing you is the number of CVEs that uh, were addressed by the year that they were, were addressed through a security update. And if you just look at this, it appears that on the surface, risk is going up. You know, there's more vulnerabilities being reported, there's more vulnerabilities being fixed. But when you juxtapose that with the chart on the right, which is showing you the percentage uh, and the number of those vulnerabilities that we actually have evidence of, of known to have been exploited within 30 days of a security update, uh, the trend actually appears to be decreasing. So uh, risk appears to be going up, but actualized risk appears to be going down. So let's try to probe this a little bit more. So of those vulnerabilities that are, or that we have evidence of being exploited, it's interesting to start to look into when and how are they exploited. So what this chart showing you is here is the percent of the CVEs uh, by when they were first exploited. And there are kind of two phases that we're looking at here. There's the phase of vulnerabilities that might have been exploited as a zero day uh, before a security update's available, or those that were exploited after a security update was available, but within 30, kind of a 30-day window. And what we see uh, increasingly is that if a vulnerability is exploited, it is most likely going to be exploited as zero day. Uh, and you can see that trend's been going up, 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 uh, even through uh, 2018. And it's gotten to the point where it's now uncommon for us to see a vulnerability exploited uh, after the security update, but within that 30-day window. So what this tells you is, uh, at the end of the day, it's most likely going to be a zero day if an exploit is, is found in the wild. Uh, now, if we look at another view, we can look at the percent of the CVEs by the first scenario in which they were attacked, like in which they were first used. And what this is showing you here is uh, a few different scenarios. Uh, targeted attack, uh, a proof of concept that a researcher may have released uh, of an exploit for vulnerability, uh, something getting pulled into a public exploit framework like Metasploit, uh, and criminal exploit kits uh, being used in the wild. And what we see here is that uh, far and away, uh, if a vulnerability is going to be exploited, the first scenario that it's going to be exploited in is in a targeted attack scenario uh, by an adversary. And more to the point is when we actually dig into this data, what's interesting is that uh, those exploits actually typically target older versions uh, of the software. They don't typically target the latest versions of the software. So I'm sure from these couple of slides, a thought's probably popped into your head about, well, what about all those zero days that you don't know about? And that's a great question. And it turns out that it is challenging for us to actually effectively estimate the number of zero days that we don't know about, right? But there's a few hypotheses and, and kind of assertions that we can make here. And so the first is that uh, as exploit cost has increased, we believe this has driven uh, a cycle and to the point that we're at now where this drives selective use. And so simply put, you can think of this as, uh, the number of times that an adversary or an attacker wants to use an exploit uh, increases the, the probability or likelihood of there being a detection of that. And so what this means is that attackers are incentivized to minimize use. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, if a target does actually detect that they've been exploited by this, uh, odds are they're going to report that to the vendor so that it can be addressed. And as a consequence of this, what's happened is that this, is, this selective use behavior has reduced downstream supply because a lot of the actors out there might not have the capability or the means uh, to actually go and acquire these exploits themselves. Now, the assertion here is that uh, over time, what's happened is that the economy around the zero-day market has actually shifted. So fast forward to today, where we have Windows 10, which has a very mature kind of update lifecycle. 
uh, you end up having pretty poor return on investment for trying to exploit a vulnerability that's going to be rapidly remediated within the ecosystem. And furthermore, if you look at something like Windows 10, there's a fast evolution cycle of major releases that are bringing new defenses, uh, not just security updates. And what we've observed in the market is that if you look at sort of the mass market exploit kit world, it appears to have become the case that they now struggle to maintain supply. Uh, they've, there's no longer this pool of reusable exploits typically or public exploits for them to use. And what's happened is that the, the cost for them to acquire now exceeds their return on investment. And as a consequence of that, we've seen the market shift more towards the social engineering type vectors. So macros, phishing, tech support scans, password spraying, all these other uh, less sophisticated, but in some cases equally effective means that don't require somebody to resort to an actual exploit. Another trend that we see here is that widespread attacks are now the exception and not the norm. And so if you go back into the early 2000s, we went through a period of time where server-side exploits for IIS, SQL, DCOM, so on and so forth were the norm, and those have essentially uh, gone away. Uh, similarly, productivity apps uh, and exploits for those, that we went through an era where uh, widespread exploitation was common for those, and it, that's not such the case anymore. And same for browsers. Uh, we went through a period where widespread exploitation was more common for browsers, and we just we don't see that anymore. And there are some milestones in defense that correlate with some of these changes in the landscape. So flashback to Windows XP Service Pack 2, uh, shipped with a firewall on by default, with DEP, some of these other mitigations enabled. And that sort of was kind of the beginning of the end of the server-side exploit era in terms of widespread attacks. Uh, Windows Vista shipping with ASLR, Office 2010 shipping with DEP, ASLR, protected view turned on. Uh, and finally, fast forward to 2015 with the Edge browser shipping with the Sandbox, ASLR, DEP, CFG, and so forth. So all these things have kind of added up to a point where we just typically don't see widespread exploitation. And this is you know, due to many factors, one being uh, pervasive sandboxing, stronger mitigations, uh, reliable update channels, and just uh, you know, the ecosystem has changed as well. It's not just Windows, there's, phone, there's mobile devices, there's other things out there for people uh, to try to target that influence this as well. But there are exceptions. Uh, so for example, in 2017, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the WannaCry incident. Um, this is an example of where a you know, weaponized exploit, uh, ready-made, ready to go, uh, became public, and this was uh, immediately something that folks could jump on and try to go uh, and, and attack folks with at a broader scale. Uh, but even there, that exploit didn't work against some of the latest versions of, of Windows at the time uh, due to various factors such as additional mitigations. So another interesting trend that I mentioned here is that we now are kind of at this point where many of the applications that uh, need to care and defend and protect customers uh, now enable sandboxes. And what's noteworthy about this is we can probe and try to see uh, whether or not we see echoes of the effects of pervasive sandboxing in some of our data. So what this chart's showing you here is the security impact of uh, vulnerabilities uh, that uh, had evidence of being exploited within 30 days of a security update by their impact, remote code execution, elevation of privilege, information disclosure. And uh, what the chart on the right is showing you is that this is the sort of uh, execution domain of those vulnerabilities. Was it a kernel mode vulnerability or was it a user mode vulnerability? And in both charts, what you can actually see here is that we see an increase proportionally in terms of elevation of privilege vulnerabilities and also uh, kernel vulnerabilities with respect to uh, user mode. And so what this is uh, hinting at here is that uh, we see more evidence of attackers needing to resort and find elevation of privilege exploits, typically focusing on uh, the kernel mode attack surface. Now, one of the things that we really try to do is deeply study the types of vulnerabilities that people are finding in our software and our services uh, so that we can actually look for patterns and think about ways to make things better. And what's noteworthy here is that at a macro scale, going all the way back to 2006, Memory safety issues remain the most common kind of in this category of vulnerabilities that we're looking at. About 70% of the vulnerabilities that are addressed through a security update each year uh, are related to a memory safety issue. And it's worth actually drilling down a bit more into that because memory safety is a big category. So what this chart's showing you here is some of the high level root cause trends uh, within this bucketing. So stack corruptions, heap corruptions, use after free, type confusion, so on and so forth. And there are a few things that are interesting to call out here. So one of these is that if you look at the dark blue at the bottom of this chart, these are stack corruption vulnerabilities. And if you go all the way back to 2006, these accounted for a non-trivial proportion of the vulnerabilities that we were actually addressing each year. But now in 2018, they're essentially a blip. Like, they essentially aren't there. So this is kind of an example of a bug class that has largely gone away. 
Uh, similarly, you might notice that there's a big spike kind of around the 2013-2014 timeframe uh, of use after freeze. And what happened here is that this was an era where attackers and researchers actually got really good at finding use after free vulnerabilities in the web browser. And so, of course, us monitoring these trends, we went and looked for ways to actually kind of categorically deal with this type of issue, which ultimately re resulted in us sh shipping a mitigation called uh, MemGC, the memory garbage collector for our DOM engine. And you can see the, the effect that that had in the following years, 2015, 2016, where we went back to more of a, a steady state in terms of the uh, percentage of use after free vulnerabilities that we saw. Now, the other call out here is that heap out of bounds reads, type confusions, uninitialized use, these have all sort of generally increased in recent years, uh, which is something that's interesting for us to look at. And the last call out is that spatial safety issues, these are uh, bounds violations where you access memory outside the bounds of an object. Uh, these continue to be one of the more common categories kind of across the period of time that we're looking at here. So these are heap out of bounds reads and writes. So if you want to kind of sum it all up, uh, the top root causes since about 2016 are heap out of bounds issues, uh, use after free issues, type confusions, and an uninitialized use in that order. Now, we've talked a little bit about exploited vulnerabilities, and it's also interesting for us to look at the root causes of the vulnerabilities that actually get exploited. And the reason why this is interesting is because this provides us hints in terms of what are, what are the types of vulnerabilities that may be easier or more preferred by attackers in terms of going and trying to exploit them. And so that's what this chart shows you here is the root cause of CVEs that were exploited within 30 days. And the things that I'll call out here are, one, uh, use after free and heap corruption continue to be sort of a preferably targeted uh, vulnerability class in terms of exploitation. But you'll also notice that there's quite a large percentage of what we classify as other in here. Uh, so they don't fall into the, the top memory safety buckets that we see. And just to give you a flavor of what these types of issues are, uh, they could be things like uh, cross-site scripting that leads to a zone elevation, uh, if you're fam familiar with Internet Explorer. They could be DLL planting issues uh, or file canonicalization uh, and, and related issues like that. So those are some of the non-memory safety issues that we actually see folks uh, trying to go after uh, in addition to, to memory safety. Now, Again, it's kind of interesting to drill even deeper. So we started from memory safety. We drilled down a bit more into the, the broad buckets of memory safety issues. Um, we can actually go deeper in terms of our classification to explore the types of spatial safety issues that we see uh, in terms of the trends. And what's noteworthy here uh, in the chart showing you is this is the sort of distribution of what we classify as adjacent spatial safety issues versus non-adjacent spatial safety issues. What does that mean? So in simple terms, adjacent spatial safety, it's a buffer overrun. It's a mem copy where you control the length and you write beyond the bounds. And the reason we call it adjacent is because the first byte that you go and corrupt or access is always going to be immediately adjacent to the buffer that you're accessing. Whereas non-adjacent is one where, as, a, as an attacker, you control the index, you control the displacement, uh, and you get a little bit more freedom in terms of that. So the call out here, and the interesting thing to observe is that, uh, in terms of the trends that we see here, is that non-adjacent spatial safety issues are increasingly uh, more common with respect to uh, adjacent spatial safety issues. So again, this is important from a defense perspective because the mitigations you might consider are different depending on the types of uh, spatial safety issues you're dealing with. So that was a quick whirlwind tour of some of the trends that we're seeing in the, in the landscape today uh, from, from our perspective for the vulnerabilities that we're actually addressing on the Microsoft side. Now we're going to shift gears and kind of take that background and use that to frame how we discuss some of the challenges uh, in the space of actually trying to mitigate vulnerabilities, you know, kind of following that strategy that I outlined at the beginning of the talk. So we're going to go through this section by each of the tactics I mentioned. So eliminating vulnerabilities, breaking exploitation techniques, uh, containing damage, and so on, and some of the challenges that we face with each of those. So let's start with eliminating vulnerabilities. So the first challenge is, if you go back to the root cause slide, you'll notice that many of the root causes of the vulnerabilities that we saw back in 2006, we still see today in 2018. And in fact, most of the vulnerability classes that existed 20, 30 plus years ago uh, still exist today. Um, now, we have had some success at eliminating vulnerabilities uh, classes, like uh, Noldy references in the kernel have uh, been fully mitigated at this point. But the fact is that most of them still remain. And we still do see many of the develop like developers making some of the same mistakes uh, that were made 10 years ago. Uh, and so this is a challenge that we're still facing in this space. 
Another one to call out is that we have seen that things like the security development lifecycle, the SDL, uh, and training can help. Like they do raise awareness, they help with the culture and the philosophy around security. But at the end of the day, the developer who's actually writing the code has tons of cognitive load that they have to keep in their head. They have to remember the thousand different rules, the thousand different ways that C++ might have undefined behavior uh, when they're actually going and trying to write their software. And what this means is that developers are often expected to self-identify, to prevent vulnerabilities. And in many cases, they don't necessarily have the tools at hand uh, to really help them out as much as we might hope. Another challenge that, that we're facing here is in, the, in eliminating vulnerabilities is that increasingly software is being developed by disjoint parties. Uh, it, like different folks may own a different component. You might have an open source library that's written by somebody else, another one that's written by somebody else, all of which are coming together uh, to form your product or your service. And what's noteworthy here is that each of these maintainers for each of these products have different security policies, different practices, different levels of understanding about the risks in this space. And this creates a, a challenge for trying to have a, a cohesive uh, response in terms of what bar you're enforcing around eliminating vulnerabilities. And at the end of the day, you're not necessarily going to be able to expect that the collection of all of the individuals involved in this uh, have gone through training, have done SDL, and so on. Uh, and another point to call it, and I think many of the folks in the audience probably already appreciate this, but it's, it's worth noting is that at the end of the day, you know, finding every vulnerability is not scalable or practical. It is necessary and important for us to actually go and hunt for vulnerabilities today, and we do, and we appreciate the researchers out there that help us do this, but it's not sufficient to really kind of change the, the landscape. And, and as we saw, you know, the number of vulnerabilities that are being found and fixed continues to increase despite tons and tons of effort uh, by folks in this room and folks uh, at, at Microsoft as well. Another challenge in eliminating vulnerabilities is that every once in a while, pretty rare, but every once in a while, we get a new vulnerability class. Uh, and one example of this is, uh, if I'm sure many of you all saw, the Spectre meltdown, the speculative execution side channel issues that popped up at the beginning of January uh, in, in 2018. Uh, so this is noteworthy because when a new vulnerability class pops up, it can have significant ramifications for how you think about the security boundaries that you developed for software. And it turns out that something like Spectre and Meltdown have implications for pretty much all the security boundaries that software has. So for processes, you know, you've got a process, you've got a kernel, there's a security boundary between those. Uh, there's a security boundary between processes that run as different users enforced by the operating system. You bring a hypervisor into the picture with virtualization, well, now you've got a security boundary between the kernel and the hypervisor, between the VMs that are on the machine. Oh, and on Windows, we actually have a technology called virtualization-based security, uh, which has virtual secure mode, where we actually have kind of subdivide even within a VM to create another security boundary between these contexts. And oh, and actually, in, in some cases, a process might also enforce a language-based uh, uh, security boundary with a software sandbox. So think about Bruno's talk when he was talking about something like Chakra. Well, Chakra is trying to enforce a language-based sandbox for the code that it's uh, jitting or, or interpreting. But with something like speculative side channels, this has implications for all of these boundaries. So again, when you think about vulnerability mitigation, now you've got to go back and think about how do we mitigate this new class of issues in all of these different scenarios. So that's some of the challenges in eliminating vulnerabilities. Uh, let's talk about now some of the challenges in breaking exploitation techniques. So since around 2012, uh, we've been pursuing a set of solutions that we've been uh, trying to design to mitigate arbitrary native code execution, regardless of the type of memory safety issue that you have. And there are sort of a, a few different uh, pillars of this. So two of these pillars actually deal with trying to prevent arbitrary code from even being generated in the process. And there are two parts of this. So one is a technology we call Code Integrity Guard, which very simply, it enforces code signing for the process. So only DLLs and executables that are properly signed are permitted to be loaded in the process. And then there's Arbitrary Code Guard. Uh, and Arbitrary Code Guard, or ACG, is designed to prevent uh, new code from being injected into the process or existing code that's signed from being modified. And both of these features are uh, mitigations that we've now shipped in the operating system. Now, it's all great and good to have properly signed code that's immutable in your process, but you also want to try to keep uh, the code that does exist on the rails. And this is where control flow integrity comes into play. And there are two parts of this. So one is a technology called control flow guard, and this is one that tries to enforce control flow integrity for indirect calls uh, and whatnot. And the second part of this is a, a shadow stack, uh, protecting return addresses and whatnot. And this is something that Whereas CFG has already been shipped uh, in Windows, uh, CET is something that's going to come in the future uh, that, uh, that we plan to leverage for Windows. 
Now at this point, uh, CFG, CIG, ACG, uh, they've been enabled for Windows 10 for Edge, for the Hyper-V VM worker process, and for the Windows kernel when you turn on HVCI. So we've started to get fairly pervasive adoption of this. So the question is, how have exploits adapted in light of these things being in place? So most of the exploits since around 2016, maybe even before that, have followed the same general script for how they go about exploiting vulnerabilities. So you start with your vulnerability. You use your, uh, you, you set up the address space to place an array base or length at some known location or offset within the address space. You use your memory corruption vulnerability to modify the array base or length using a memory corruption. Uh, and so this is what's going to give you the ability to read and write to arbitrary locations of memory. So this is exactly what uh, Bruno talked about in his talk previously. You're going to then use that arbitrary read-write to go and discover where things like DLL and code are located in the address space. In some cases, you might need to learn where other things are located, like the stack. So you'll, you'll go and grovel for that. With this information, you'll go and construct uh, a ROT payload. You, you discovered your gadgets. You'll dynamically construct a ROT payload uh, using the code sequences that you found. And now it's the point where you're going to actually go and try to hijack control flow. You might corrupt a return address. You might corrupt a function pointer. You might corrupt a virtual table pointer. Uh, any of these methods to ultimately get to the point where now you're executing that ROT payload that you've constructed. Now, after, when your ROT payload's running, typically what's going to happen next is you're going to try to actually transition that into being able to run arbitrary code, because it's kind of annoying to do something fully in ROP. And now you're done. Now you're running arbitrary code. So that's kind of the, the typical flow. But there are some other flows uh, that attackers might try to do. So they might take their arbitrary read-write, and rather than go through all the hops of trying to hijack control flow, run arbitrary native code, they'll actually go and corrupt the state of a security policy. Or uh, they might try to just simply read sensitive content if they're just trying to do an information disclosure. So when you have something like CFG, CIG, and ACG in place, uh, what we've actually observed attackers do are sort of three things. So one, simply, uh, if the target that you can want to go after doesn't enable all these things, then that's actually the most preferred route to go. Uh, the second one is that, well, since we don't have uh, protection for return addresses yet, uh, corrupting the return address is the second most preferred way. And then third is uh, just going the route of data-only corruption, where you don't actually need to hijack control flow. So, you know, as I mentioned, we have uh, shipped Control Flow Guard. It's been there for a while now, and we've actually learned a lot through this. And one of the challenges that we've actually faced here is that uh, delivering a robust, efficient, and compatible Control Flow Integrity solution is hard. Uh, you know, we do believe that something like uh, Control uh, CET, uh, Intel's Control Enforcement te Technology, will actually address the last major sort of gap here in terms of return address protection. But even then, there are design limitations of CFG that make it hard to provide a, a really comprehensive solution in this space when you assume attacker can read and write arbitrary memory at arbitrary times. So there are a few limitations that are worth calling out here. So one of them is just uh, by design, CFG is implemented as coarse-grained control flow integrity. So this means you can only call valid functions, but you can call any valid function out of context. And so this uh, creates more permutations for things that attackers might be able to do, given that valid uh, function set. The second is that there are places uh, in Windows where there's actually a, a dynamic construction of what's equivalent to a CPU context. So when you think about how the uh, DLL loader works. And when you think about how the exception handler or the unwinder work, these things are actually kind of modifying the CPU state and will continue execution uh, in different ways. And it's possible that you might actually be able to use your memory corruption to hijack control flow there rather than going after a typical function pointer. Another one is, in many cases, a CFG actually relies on certain things being read-only in memory. Uh, for example, the import address table is one that we rely on being read-only in memory. And if an attacker can uh, coerce an application into being able to make that read-only memory writable, then they can bypass uh, some of the security guarantees uh, that CFG tries to enforce. Uh, another one is reusing stale code pointers. So for example, imagine you can coerce an application into suspending a thread, you unmap a DLL, you go and map something new there, and then you resume the thread. Well, whatever uh, instruction pointer that referred to is now it been invalidated, and now you may be able to execute something that's useful that, uh, again, isn't kind of within the scope of something that CFG would typically protect against. And then finally, there's downgrade attacks. So when you think about trying to uh, coerce the application to loading a DLL that maybe didn't have, wasn't fully instrumented, or it had another limitation uh, that could now be leveraged uh, in the context of this. Uh, so there was a, a much more detailed talk about this that we gave at, uh, at OffensiveCon that I encourage you to check out if you want to learn more. But these are some of the challenges that we're facing here.
And so those are challenges with control flow integrity, but there's also challenges on the data-only corruption side of the house. Uh, and that's, that it generally remains kind of a generally unsolved problem at this point. And when you think about mitigating data-only corruption, uh, it, it essentially becomes equivalent to mitigating memory safety all up in many cases. Uh, and in, in most cases, it's not going to be practical to try to isolate the sensitive data or whatever it is that you're trying to protect uh, from being corrupted in this way. So I'll give a few examples very quickly. So one is the one that we talked about previously, uh, corrupting an array base or an array length. Well, sure, it'd be great if we could prevent those from being corrupted, but it ends up being pretty hard, right? Uh, at the end of the day, Protecting this means not only do you need to protect all arrays, but more than likely than not, you're going to have to protect all pointers to arrays. And then you're going to have to protect all pointers to pointers. And this kind of cascades down into, well, well, now you're trying to solve memory safety. Another good example, sort of a classic example, is that on Windows, uh, the way that we represent processes in the kernel uh, and the I identity that they run with is uh, the token field on the eProcess object. And one of the things that attackers will typically do is use a data-only corruption to replace that token uh, with one of a privileged process, like system. Uh, and they'll go and use this to elevate privileges. Uh, and this is another example where it's challenging to mitigate this because, uh, well, eProcess is a dynamically allocated, mutable, and frequently accessed data structure. And so it's not necessarily practical to make that read-only. Similarly, trying to take an eProcess and move it into an isolated context uh, is not necessarily practical as well because this is used pervasively across the kernel. And finally, on the same sub subject as the kernel, as the eProcess token field, uh, you can think about uh, kernel objects in Windows and the access control list and how we actually enforce access control to those objects. This is another example of where you can actually go and try to corrupt that, uh, grant your less privileged user access to a more privileged object, and use this to elevate privileges. So these are just a few examples uh, of challenges kind of in the space of mitigating data-only corruption. But you can imagine that there are many other examples as well. All right, so let's talk about challenges in containing damage and preventing persistence. So one of the challenges that we face here, and there was actually a, a fun discussion about this on Twitter recently, uh, has to do with trying to limit the kernel attack surface on Windows. Uh, and in particular, one of the challenges that we face is trying to limit the kernel system calls that may be available to an application in a way that can be configurable. Uh, and one of the reasons that this is hard for Windows is because we intentionally don't want applications to take dependencies on the system calls that we use under the hood. We want to be able to change this. This is one of the reasons that Windows has been so successful, is we've had the ability to change some of the implementation guts under the hood and retain application compatibility. So trying to extend that into a space that allows applications to restrict system calls is a challenge. But we do have some alternatives. So one is uh, uh, virtual, virtualized containers like Windows Defender Application Guard actually provide a pretty good uh, and, and useful alternative to trying to do this type of system call filtering because they actually just shove the whole kernel into a virtual machine. Uh, and now you've actually uh, restricted that kernel surface. Another challenge that we face here is uh, what we call kind of efficient and finer grain compartmentalization. And one of the reasons this is a challenge is if you think about something like Control Flow Guard, uh, where we'd really like to be able to isolate the loader and the exception handler and the unwinder, well, practically speaking, it's harder to isolate something more than a process today. Uh, and uh, this is one of, the, one of the things that makes it hard for us to actually go and try to address some of those limitations. And furthermore, when you think about trying to adapt software to a finer grained compartmentalized environment, most of the designs and implementations that exist today weren't, aren't really easily portable to kind of this concept of running in a more fine grained compartment. And the third challenge here is that uh, there are increasing uh, tensions uh, between the desire to have high density and performance on one hand and uh, having sort of hostile multi-tenant isolation on the other hand. Uh, Concrete examples here are when you think about a web browser or you think about a container, you want to be as highly dense as possible uh, for the performance of the system. But you also want to have hostile multi-tenancy guarantees. For the web browser, you don't want sites on the web to be able to influence each other. And for containers, you don't want tenants running in different containers to be able to influence each other. And uh, as a concrete example, one of the challenges here, if you think about, again, speculative side channels uh, and, and the mitigations here, uh, these have had an effect on density with the, the need for site isolation to move sites into their own processes, the need for core isolation to actually mitigate uh, things like L1 terminal fault, uh, and the overhead that's placed on things like context switching. So uh, these are some other challenges that are being faced in this space. Uh, so challenges in terms of limiting the window of time to exploit. So one of the challenges here is that when you think about something like long-term support, 
uh, this tends to be at, at odds and have issues with the evolving threat landscape. So long-term support is great for customers, but at the same token, when you think about how the landscape evolves, uh, it becomes challenging for some of the older versions of software to actually be able to, uh, to mitigate the threats of, of today uh, that weren't there tomorrow. And that's you know, in large part because advancements in defense uh, and some of the big mitigations that may come into future versions of a product aren't necessarily or likely to be brought back to older versions. Um, and yeah, so this is one of the challenges that we face here. Another challenge, uh, which has been a theme uh, here at Blue Hat uh, Israel, is that it uh, comes back to supply chain. Uh, and this is in particular has to do with software supply chain. So when you think about the world of open source software uh, and the many interlinked dependencies and the actual update life cycle for these components, uh, this creates a challenge in terms of how you think about trying to limit the window of time to exploit a vulnerability. Uh, so we're increasingly in a space where uh, applications and services have taken a dependency. Many folks have taken dependencies on various open source projects. And when you think about the scenario where there's a vulnerability in, those, in one of those components, coordinating uh, the, you know, the mitigation uh, of that issue amongst all of the folks that depend on it uh, is an increasing challenge for the industry at large. So those are a few of the challenges. So let's think about those trends, let's think about those challenges, and now start to think more about how might we look at this differently? How might we try to change our thinking and how we want to approach the space of vulnerability mitigation going forward? So to start this out, let's ask the question, what should software development look like in the future? Just what should it look like? Uh, should it still be easy for developers to make the mistakes they do today? No, I don't think we really want that. Uh, should software and service vendors still be fixing a non-trivial number of vulnerabilities? Hopefully not. Uh, should consumers and businesses still be concerned about the risk associated with software vulnerabilities? Again, I, you know, I don't think so. And so really, we kind of land on this question of what can we do to actually get to a point where we're done with vulnerabilities? How can we actually try to realistically approach this space so that, you know, however many years from now, we actually are at a state where these really aren't major issues for us? So what, what does done mean? So the sort of concept of done is something that uh, John Lambert, if you know him from Microsoft, actually uh, challenged us to, to think about uh, here a few years ago. And when we think about what done means, uh, done is basically uh, equivalent to software vulnerabilities just aren't a significant problem anymore. It doesn't mean we've gotten to zero vulnerabilities. It means that they're just not a significant problem. And if you look at this from the lens of, say, a customer, well, from the customer's perspective, you know, this means there's you know, pretty minimal risk of them actually being attacked by a vulnerability. And the security updates that they actually uh, deal with today are, become uncommon. They're not disruptive. You know, they aren't really something that people have to consciously think about. Uh, for attackers, what this means is that exploitable vulnerabilities uh, are uncommon. You know, there may still be vulnerabilities, but you know, they shouldn't really be exploitable. And furthermore, exploiting those vulnerabilities is sim just simply not economically viable anymore, even to some of the big players that exist today. And for vendors, if you think about like, somebody like Microsoft, for example, the total cost of secure software and development should start to become less and less and more minimal over time. And so as I said, you know, we don't have to get to zero vulnerabilities to get to done. And there are other challenges. Like for instance, we've talked a lot about memory safety today, but there are other classes of issues like design and logic flaws, which are admittedly much more complex to think about how you're gonna tackle those in terms of a getting to done state. Uh, and those will require more thought, but they can sort of fit in with this philosophy as well. And getting to done doesn't mean everybody's done at once. It doesn't mean we wake up tomorrow and the entire software industry is done. It could mean that, well, for this particular application or this particular service, you've kind of achieved this state uh, uh, with these properties. And obviously, there's tons of challenges here. But you know, if we think about what we need for the software industry and what we need to achieve going forward, you know, I think it's necessary that we challenge ourselves to approach this state. So how might we think about moving the needle more towards getting to done. And so the mitigation tactics that I started out the presentation with are still completely relevant. They, they are absolutely still useful for how we think about approaching this problem space, but really more what we want to try to think about is how do we tune our strategic objective here? And really it comes down to how can we shift the goalposts from increasing cost and difficulty, which how do you know when enough is enough, toward that state of actually getting to done? So I'll give a few examples here, just as a high level of, of how you might think about tuning some of those tactics. So one example is, again, we've talked a lot about eliminating vulnerabilities. So 
one opportunity here is to actually focus more attention on how do we make unsafe code safer. And we've been doing this for a while now, but there's more that we can do here. And this is, again, how can we eliminate common classes of memory safety vulnerabilities? And there are various ways that we can actually try to do this. We can introduce more uh, rigorous build time errors that just become de facto standard, both you know, thinking about at Microsoft or more broadly in the, in in the industry. And we can also think about things like runtime prevention, uh, where we may not be able to eliminate it at compi compile time, but we can deterministically mitigate it at runtime. The second one, second one is a, a common theme, and this has come up many times in history, but really, this is about thinking about how do we seriously transition to safer languages where it's necessary and warranted. And so this means not only stop, it doesn't mean stop using C++. It means make C++ safer uh, by default. And it also does mean using safer alternative languages. So you think about Rust as an alternative for safer systems programming. You think about something like C Sharp, for example, for just general application development. And as I mentioned, you know, we can make C++ safer. There's been a lot of work in things like the C++ core guidelines, which actually do a lot of work to try to provide developers with the tools to make smart decisions uh, in this space. And we can also make use of uh, practical memory safety languages. And the third is, it's not all about security. So we actually do want to approach this problem from a, how do we make things safer, but how do we also make developers more efficient uh, in how they do their work? And so things like, how can we provide developers with the tools to automatically fix vulnerabilities? How can we actually improve the performance when you write safe code as compared to unsafe code? And when you think about it, really so the efforts in the space focus more on how do we make it durably difficult and hard for developers to make mistakes in the first place while allowing them to maintain good performance and efficiency. So I'll just highlight two examples. I'd love to talk more about this, but we don't have enough time today. But I'll highlight two examples of progress towards this direction. So one example of sort of this concept of making unsafe code safer uh, is work that we've been doing in the space of uninitialized use vulnerabilities. So uh, for Microsoft, uh, one of the trends that we observed is we saw lots of vulnerabilities being reported where uh, uninitialized memory uh, on the stack was actually being disclosed to user mode in various places. And the pattern here had to do with uh, padding bytes of structures not being initialized because there's no way to initialize them from the language. So unless you zero memory uh, for the structure, it's never going to be zeroed. And so what we've actually done is added support to the compiler and now built the entire Windows kernel and all of the device drivers with this mitigation that we called init all that actually uh, will zero padding bytes in these cases. So this is a great example where we've now killed this bug class, which was about 50 vulnerabilities over the course of a couple years, uh, and now we just don't have to deal with it anymore. Uh, another example, again, on this theme of transitioning to safer languages, uh, this is a great example of trying to make C++ safer. And in particular, this has to do with uh, leveraging, again, one of the C++ core guidelines technologies, which is GSL span. And you can simply think of GSL span as rather than simply using raw pointers uh, and array indices, you use span uh, as a tool to provide you with the ability to have sort of transparent bounds checking for your code. It basically just turns a pointer into a pointer and a length, and it will do the bounds checking for you. Uh, and as a concrete example of how this has worked well for us is we've actually taken this, we've gone and applied it pervasively across Hyper-V, and we've seen evidence of after we did this, later we discovered vulnerabilities uh, that had been completely mitigated uh, in terms of uh, being able to exploit them because we moved to GSL span. So again, there's a lot of work to be done in this case. I'll, I'll highlight a couple examples of where we're sort of focusing our R&D and how we think we're going to try to move the needle forward here. It's, it's eliminating common classes of vulnerabilities. It's adopting safer languages where it matters. It's looking into how can we do efficient and finer grain compartmentalization. And it is still, how can we have stronger and more robust exploit mitigations? Because we know we're not going to reach this kind of done state overnight, and we're going to need to continue to, to make it as difficult and, and costly to exploit vulnerabilities while we're working toward that. Uh, and so we do believe that in focusing kind of in these areas uh, can start to help us really address some of the challenges that I talked about previously. Now, it's important to remember that there are other threats. We spent this whole talk focusing just on vulnerabilities, but there are a lot of other threats out there, and it's worth actually focusing attention on mitigating those, those two. So we can't just have blinders on and say we're only going to look at vulnerabilities. We've got to look across all of the threats and think about how we want to mitigate those two. Uh, we highlighted that as the cost of exploiting vulnerabilities has gone up, we've seen other vectors increase related to social engineering, password spraying, all these other things. Those are really important too, and so we've got to think about those. So to close, um, you know, 
based off of the trends that we're seeing, you know, we believe that our strategy has had a positive impact on helping to shift the landscape, and we're continuing to think about how we want to refine it. Uh, there's you know, lots of the challenges that I talked about today uh, are not just Microsoft challenges, they're actually industry challenges. And so you know, Microsoft and the rest of the folks in the industry need to think about how we work together to go and tackle some of these. And you know, we're super excited about the progress that we're going to make towards this space. Uh, I, I feel like I have one of the most exciting jobs in the industry, being on the front lines of some of this. And I'm, I'm really excited about what we're going to be able to do here. And, and I hope you can help us. So that's it. Thank you.